My mom's friend had a small house and lived alone. She noticed weird things, a batch of soup depleting faster than usual, missing eggs, damp towels in the hamper when she hadn't used any, extra dishes in the dishwasher, etc. This went on for months, she thought she was just being forgetful. One day, she heard some thumping around in her attic and went to investigate. She found some makeshift living quarters. Small radio, hot plate, sleeping bag, pillow, food wrappers, etc. She called the cops who came to keep an eye on the place. They ended up catching a homeless man climbing a tree, trying to sneak into her attic window. He had been doing this almost daily. He would wait for her to go to work, then go downstairs and help himself to food and amenities. The funny part about this story is they got to know each other throughout the ordeal, and the guy was actually very respectful, just down on his luck. She didn't press charges, instead, let him move in, helped him get a job, and he lived in the attic until he got back on his feet. Creepy shit with a happy ending. I work at a max security prison, and we have several inmates who are severely mentally ill. The ones that self-harm wear a fitted kind of thing to monitor heart rate. If there is a change, we rush their room to stop whatever is happening. On top of this, we also do visual inspections. On one round, a co-worker was doing cell checks and noticed this particular inmate had blood on their face, but nothing came up on the monitors or anything. So we called to the inmates to ask if they were okay. The inmate had their eyes closed and just kept repeating, it doesn't hurt. The inmate would not answer where the blood was from. We opened the cell to see what the situation was and it turns out the inmate had plucked out both of their eyes and they were laying on the floor. The inmate's HR monitor never alerted and the inmate never screened. Paramedics said the inmate's vitals were normal and the inmate was fully responsive. Before my dad died, he once told me a story from when he was in Vietnam in the 1960s. He told me about a mission where he and one other American with five CIDG strikers, South Vietnamese villagers turned fighters, were tasked to emplace seismic ground sensors along a trail network deep in the jungle. He said they were about two days into the mission when he and two of the strikers split off from the main group to go watch a nearby trail intersection. He said the jungle was pretty quiet that day, just the sounds of birds and bugs and an occasional monkey. He said they had been watching the trail intersection for about three or four hours and were deciding on whether to move further down the trail or to turn back and link up with the rest of the patrol. Before leaving the cover of the brush, my dad said he checked the trail ahead of them one last time and prepared his men to move. Now here is where the story gets interesting and he told this part with absolute dead seriousness. He said just as he started to step out onto the trail, he sees a light-skinned black Union cavalry soldier in full battle gear laying alongside the trail just shy of the intersection. My dad said the Union soldier had two pistols, a Spencer rifle and a short curved club at his hip. As my dad was trying to process what he was seeing, the soldier looked directly at him and smiled. Then the soldier slowly placed a finger up to his lips as if to tell him to be silent and then motioned my dad back off the trail. My dad said he signaled for his men to remain hidden and he recalled that as he slipped back into the jungle on one side of the trail, the Union soldier did the same on his side of the trail. Less than 10 seconds later, he said the lead element of a group of NVA, North Vietnamese Army soldiers, walked right through the trail intersection some 30 feet away. My dad estimated that the group was comprised of some 70 to 80 soldiers equipped with automatic rifles, light machine guns and rocket-propelled grenade launchers. He has no doubt that his entire team would have been wiped out on the spot. He said as soon as the enemy soldiers had passed, he and his team beat feet out of there as fast and as quietly as they could and rejoined with the rest of the patrol. 
He reported the enemy soldiers his team had encountered, but decided not to say anything about the soldier he had seen. My dad kept this secret for many, many years, only telling me just before he passed and earlier only telling his grandmother on her deathbed in the 1970s. He said when he told his grandmother, she smiled and without opening her eyes told him, you saw old Red Tom. Red Tom was my great-great-grandfather. He was a half-black slash half-creek free man who was a scout for the Union Army during the Civil War and later served with the U.S. Cavalry in the American West. He was known for carrying two pistols, a Spencer rifle, and a Creek War Club into battle. Many years ago, before there were cell phones, we had these things called pagers strapped to our hips. Someone would page you with their phone number, and you would call them back when you got to a phone. As an on-call technician, working in the audio-visual field, my pager would go off all the freaking time. Like most people who used pagers, our clients knew that if you followed up your number with a 911, that would indicate to the technician to stop what they were doing and call right away. Although I was always busy, I rarely if ever got 911s. One afternoon traveling from Orlando to St. Petersburg via Interstate 4, my pager goes off with a number I don't recognize, followed by the 911. I find the first exit and pull into a little truck stop looking place outside of Plant City to use the pay phone. This takes maybe three minutes tops. I walk in, ask for some change and head to the wall where there are four pay phones to choose from. I pop my quarter in and dial the number displayed on my trusty pager. It rings. And rings. Who would page me with a 911 and not answer their phone? It's just about then that I notice another ringing sound in addition to the one in my ear. I pull the handset from my ear and two phones over on the wall another pay phone is ringing, but with an incoming call. I hang up by the handset and the ringing stops on the other phone. I walk a few paces over, pick up the handset, and look at the phone number printed above the buttons. I look at the number on my pager. I look at the number on the phone. I look at the number on my pager again. I look at the phone again. Except for the 911, they are identical. I kind of lose my breath for a second, and then I make my way over to the girl at the counter and ask if she saw anyone use the pay phone. She said I was the, the only person in the store in the last hour. The whole episode probably took 15 minutes, but man, I was freaked out. The hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up and I just wanted out of there. I get about 10 miles down the highway and come upon a scene that looked like a bomb went off. Four car pile up involving a tractor trailer hauling a load of steel that had come loose state troopers and paramedics just arriving. I pulled over to the side and helped the best I could, but it was all pretty much over once it began. I have no idea why I got that page or from whom or what, but I'm convinced that if I hadn't, I would not be alive to write this today. When I was a baby, my dad played on a softball team. Typical social team, out for beers and pizza after with the guys, family event type thing. My parents were good friends with two of the other couples, both of them had young kids as well. On this occasion, the other two couples had left their kids at one of their houses, with a babysitter they were splitting. They invited my parents back to the house to have some more beers that night, but I was being fussy and my mom nixed the idea though they would 100% have normally gone back to hang out. Well, it turned out my fussiness on that day saved our lives. When the other parents got back to the house, they walked in on a home invasion. Two men had broken in, tied up the kids and the babysitter and her boyfriend, and were waiting for the parents. Took the parents hostage as well and made the dads drive with them to banks slash a grocery store where one dad was manager and clear out accounts slash a safe. They then came back to the house and slaughtered both families, 
the babysitter, and her boyfriend. Kids included. They caught the two guys later on. My dad attended the trials and said it was the first time he had ever had thoughts of supporting the death penalty. It still gives me chills to know how close we came to getting killed that day, too. Years ago, when I was eight, my family lived in this big weird house kind of on the edge of a small town. The school district was in the middle of a big restructuring, so even though we were only a couple grades apart, my brother and I went to different schools and took different buses. This left me as the last person to leave in the morning and the first person to get home in the afternoon, which meant it was my job to make sure all the lights were off and the door was locked. One morning, I noticed the basement door was open and the light was on, so before I left, I turned off the light and closed the door. When I got home that afternoon, the light was on and the door was open again. I just assumed that I'd forgotten to actually take care of it when I noticed it in the morning, so I went over to turn off the light and close the door. When I got to the top of the basement stairs, I looked, and there was a big shadowy male figure towards the bottom of the staircase. I freaked out, slammed the door, and pushed a bunch of boxes against it, and then went and hid in my closet. For months, I didn't tell my family because I was positive what I had seen was a ghost and didn't think anyone would believe me. Then about a year after that incident, my mom and her boyfriend realized that small amounts of money had been going missing for months, totaling around $800 to $900, but never more than $60 at once. So we all walked around the house with flashlights trying to figure out how they could have gotten in. Turns out some creep was climbing in through a small hole in the outside of the house, shimmying through a crawl space, then coming up into the house through the basement. Realizing I had been alone in the house with him on at least one occasion was one of the worst, most terrifying moments I've ever had. I used to run the boilers in a DOE building. Apparently at some point in the 80s, Three people were murdered over involvement in a big VCR theft. VCRs meant for the school system had apparently been stolen out of this warehouse. It was an inside job. Something went wrong. The head custodian was found shot to death, and later the bodies of the other two were reported buried in Monticello. But word is, they had first been incinerated. In the boilers, I was in charge of operating and maintaining. There were three operational boilers, and one that wasn't in service. No clue which one was supposedly used. But when you're firing them up, you're typically the only person in the building. Not a single day went by that I fired them up and didn't wonder which one was used. But that wasn't what gave me the real heebie-jeebies. You have to clean the interior of these boilers really well. Otherwise, the fire won't transfer heat to the water very efficiently, especially with number 6 oil. These boilers would build up a lot of soot. You have to suit up in a Tyvek suit, wear a mask, and climb right into the firebox. I found myself staring down the business end of that burner many times, wondering what that panic would feel like. I'm reasonably sure these people were dead before getting put in the boiler, though. Once... I was actually in one boiler while another one was running. The valve that isolated my boiler from the main steam line wasn't holding, and by the time I realized how warm it was getting, it was enough to panic. Trying to lift myself up and belly crawl through the small opening, the metal was almost too hot to keep my hands on for long. Definitely creepy experience, considering the history of that boiler room. Judy Kirby murdered six children and one adult by intentionally driving the wrong way on a divided highway in an attempt to commit suicide. She had been hospitalized for depression, but had also just ended a relationship with her ex-husband's brother and was by some reports involved in drug trafficking and fearing an imminent arrest. She picked up her sister's son, who was celebrating his 10th birthday that day. She then loaded her three children into the car, 
supposedly to pick up a gift for the nephew. Instead, she went missing with the carload of kits. A short time later, calls started coming into 911 about a car going the wrong way down the highway at a high rate of speed. They made it about 90 seconds before a head-on collision with another vehicle, driven by a father with two children and another child along for the ride. The crash annihilated both vehicles. The only survivors were Kirby herself and the child who was along for the ride in the other car. There were pieces of children all over the highway. She was sentenced to 215 years in prison. My friend had this neighbor who was a retired mechanic. They lived on some properties with large front lawns and long driveways. His neighbor had a couple derelict cars parked up near his garage that he took parts from occasionally. This neighbor of his started hearing noises while sitting in his living room, coming from his front yard. Every time he'd go to the window, there would be nothing there. He assumed it was a raccoon or a coyote or whatever. He kept hearing the noise so he'd go outside to look around but would find nothing. He'd put out traps and occasionally catch something, yet the noise persisted. Soon, he started claiming that he was hearing voices coming from the front yard like whispering. He'd go outside and look around the perimeter of his property but would find nothing. It was persistent so he'd started calling the cops. Every time the cops came and looked around and would find nothing. So they told him he needed to stop calling them for this and perhaps get a security camera or whatever. So this guy thought he was losing his mind. One summer evening he couldn't sleep so he went to the back patio to smoke a cigarette. Suddenly, he heard voices coming from the front of his house. He put his cig out and snuck around to the front and got there just in time to see the doors to his derelict conversion van silently shut. He ran back to the backyard and went inside his home and called the police to tell them what he had seen. The police arrived and approached cold, i.e. without light slash sirens, and when they approached the van, the doors swung open and a bunch of people ran out in every direction. Upon searching the van, the cops found syringes and paraphernalia and determined that people were shooting up in there. My dad and some friends got drunk and went for a drive on some back roads and were going as fast as the truck would go as teenagers. My dad was slightly less drunk than the others and eventually demanded they let him get out. They pulled over and he and one other girl got out. He and the girl started walking to town while the other three sped off in the opposite direction. Well, less than a mile up the road from where they got out is an extremely sharp turn, which they missed and hit a tree going pretty close to triple digits miles per hour. Two of them died on impact, and the only reason the third survived is because they crashed in front of a house that two doctors lived in. The survivor was paralyzed and lost his leg and part of his arm, and was in the hospital for eight months before dying. This was in the 60s, so medical care wasn't what it is today. When I first got my permit, my dad took me to that corner to explain the importance of safe driving. It gave me goosebumps about how close he was to being in the truck. He said that the dad of the driver got what remained of the truck to be hung up in the center of town for months after to be a warning to all. One night, I was out at a bar with a friend I was visiting in New Rochelle, New York. We went outside for a cigarette, and a car came flying past the bar. The car burned through a red light and started going up this hill that was on a curve. We watched as he veered over the double yellow and smashed head on with another car coming from the other direction. Both cars hind ends lifted up, then slammed down. The car that was driving correctly burst into flames. I ran inside and grabbed the fire extinguisher, then yelled to the bartender to call 911 and say there has been an accident. My friend, a few other patrons, and me ran to the cars. Now, I used to think this was a fictional trope, 
but I was pretty drunk before this happened, and I swear it sobered me up instantly. I tried spraying the fire, but it did nothing. The fumes and heat were awful, and all we could do was stand back. The worst part was, and this will haunt me forever, was that the woman in the burning car was screaming as she died. My God, it was the worst sound ever. The fire department came and put the fire out. The police took us back to the bar and took statements. I found out the next day in the news that the car that was not speeding was being driven by a young woman coming home late from work. She was a block away from home, and I think she was either newly married or a new mother. The rotten motherfucker driving the other car was some rich drunk cocksucker. He lost a leg, but otherwise was physically unharmed. I have no clue if he did time, as I left to go back home a day or so later. I'm trying to find a link for the news story, but I can't, as this was maybe six or seven years back.